Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government control 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Seeds of Liberty podcast. This is episode 65. As always, the Seeds of Liberty podcast is covered by the BIPCOT No Government License. This allows reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information about this at BIPCOT.org. So this week, we have our friend Jared Howe sitting in again for Danilo. Hey, Jared. How you doing, man? Woo. What's can't, up? We, we can't see Jared this week. It's a Skype con conspiracy, but we're going to work around it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and as our guest, we have uh, Mike Shipley, who is with the Outright Libertarian. And hey. <laughs> uh, the website is outrightusa.com. Uh, they have Facebook and Twitter pages, too. I will put all those in the show notes. So, Mike. Dot, dot org. Dot org. I apologize. You are absolutely correct. It is, it is outright USA.org. I wrote that down. He said it to me and I wrote it down. That's my fault. <laughs> it's all right. What ha this is what happens when I don't smoke enough pot before the show. No, um, this is what happens when you don't wear your <laughs> Bipcot hat. Anyway, Mike, thank you very much for joining us this week. It's a pleasure to have Alan, man. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. Why don't you tell us a little about uh, what you guys got going on and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what kind of questions we can fire at you. <laughs> All right, so um, Outright Libertarians is the, um, and this is the last time you'll hear me use the acronym LGBT in this podcast, <laughs> but I'm going to say it because people know what that means, but we are the GSM, and I'll explain what that means in a minute, caucus in the Libertarian Party. So our mission statement is to serve as a two-way bridge between the Libertarian Party and those with differing sexual orientations or gender identities, and then it goes on and it it's a longer mission statement, but that, that's kind of the nutshell right there. So um, that kind of metaphor of the bridge, like before I launch into a big long monologue, I'll just kind of pause for you to respond. But um, in, in just a moment after you respond, I'll like paint a better picture of what that really means. So you said GSM, what, what, what is that? So GSM stands for Gender and Sexual Minorities. And I mean, I don't know how long we have for me to like go into the history, but like the acronym is like completely absurd at this point. And there's like a really long, like it, I guess it makes sense if you've been around for 40 years and you understood where each letter came from and why it's actually there. But um, it actually doesn't make sense because we don't need like a thousand letters in the acronym and everyone fighting over which oh, one. Oh, you're talking about the L B G T Q P Q R S positive side right. exclamation. Yeah. B B Y O Q. <laughs> Bring your own barbecue. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's we just We're going to co opt everyone. <laughs> <laughs> right. So just come on in. So GSM is actually kind of retro. It's actually. I believe it's from the 70s. And then they pushed it aside because, oh, we're not minorities and this and this and that. And next thing you know, there's this giant acronym. And I ran across this. I mean, there are people who still use it. It's just not the the approved one. But, but we're, but we're bringing it back because Aww. it's cool. It's totally freaking cool. It covers everybody. It even, you know, it embraces marginalized heterosexual identities like BDSM, sex workers, polyamorous oh, really? uh, communities, you know, all of those are marginalized um, relationship identities. And so we just kind of thought that GSM just covers everybody. It never has to change. It's, it's just, it is what it is and it's cool. It's kind yeah, of, it's I, retro, I, I, but it's kind of it. yeah, yeah. yeah, I like it. So, well, it's kind of like the, it seems simpler, which 
would seem like it would be more in 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 theory just normally that would make it more inclusive in general right so and that's what you that's what you want to be about right so that would that seems to make a heck of a lot of sense to me i mean i never understood i mean i understood why people kept wanting to add letters to the acronym because everybody wanted to feel inclusive but it seems like you guys it's funny you say it's retro because technically i guess it is but it's it's it seems very interesting that more people haven't thought to take that approach because it it's the simpler approach rather than just saying, oh, well, we'll just add a letter every time a new person comes on. We'll create well, every time a new language. Or yeah, you'll have, you'll, little... you'll, you'll, have like a, you'll have the alphabet doubled by the time you're done. Why not just do it this way? This, this is, I like this. I've, I've, I mean, I've, I've obviously never, I've never heard the GSM term before, but it, it makes a heck of a lot of sense to me. Say that again. You said gender and sexual minorities. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That, that totally makes sense. And, and you know, I get, I get the, the minority thing. If you're going to have laws that affect sexual behavior, you're going to create minorities that have adverse, you know, things happen to them due to these laws. Well, so I understand uh, the uh, the my, having a sexual or a, a gender, you know, minority. I don't, in a, I don't understand in why there should be laws governing sexual behavior outside of consent. Right? Oh, I exactly. Mean, right. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. Like if 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 it's a consensual act and it doesn't harm hurt anybody or there's no victims, what business of but, the state yeah, is but, it? But what you when you have gay groups pop up and when you have all these other groups pop up, uh, they don't pop up because of there not being of there being no sexual laws on the book. There's sexual laws like sodomy is banned, oral sex is banned in a lot of states. Yeah, it's, none of that is is that really enforced anywhere though? I mean, how do you enforce that? Well, it might be selectively so, enforced on homosexuals if it was so politically convenient, wouldn't la- you think? Last time it happened was in Texas. Not that long ago, they, I think. They just the, – some state senate just passed some. I think it was Illinois or Michigan. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to me like the biggest threat to, uh, you know, gender or sexual minorities would be um, uh, other people, not necessarily the government, but prejudiced people that – you know, outside of the government, because how many government agents are you going to come in contact with or how much is a government policy really going to affect your life in the abstract? It's going to be the individuals you interact with, right? Well, you might be surprised, you know, and it's actually kind of a thought process that we had to go through in the post-marriage world because, you know, there are stray elephants, I'll just put it kindly, in the party who wish we would go away, who are really embarrassed that the party has this these more radical roots. And um, so in the post-marriage, like, yay, we have equality now. Um, not that, you know, that's the plan. Uh, so in, in the incremental se- sense, getting rid of the marriage bans was a step towards getting completely rid of the state over our families and our relationships. But um, there were a lot of people who were like, oh, how are you relevant now? Oh, you can go away now, right? And then we're <laughs> like, no, no, we're not going to go away. So we took the uh, non-aggression principle and we actually were like, okay, what are all the ways that the state is still a source of harm in our lives? And um, I don't know if you guys can see in the little chat here, but I put this get your laws off our backs thing. And maybe when you post the video, you can post this like along with it. Sure. And here's like, and this is actually an incomplete list. It's just kind of, these are the ones that made the actual list, but there's uh, prohibitions on adopting into same-sex families. There's the way that you are assigned a gender at birth and then you're held accountable to conforming for that gender until you die. So, you know, this is where like you're using the restroom and they're going to check your genitals against your ID and charge you with a crime if you don't match right there. And by the way, I'll just, just on that point, um, the infants who are born intersex, which is what the I stands for, and it it used to be called hermaphrodite, but hermaphrodite's considered a slur now, so it's intersex. But anyway, I digress from the fact that if, for example, if you're born into foster care and basically your case manager is your your state, if you're a ward of the state, they will literally mutilate you. The 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 that um, caseworker will choose your gender and they'll surgery they'll do the surgery. Whoa. To, to, so you know, so if you're if you, born as a like a hermaphrodite, like medically speaking, and you get put in in state or foster care like that, they will have a gender reassignment surgery forced on the child. Right, there's an actual case, and I think it was South Carolina where <laughs> that's evil. <laughs> you know, the child grew up, and they're like, "Hey, by the way, I'm male, and you assigned me female, and 
now you've irreversibly, you know, removed this body part that I wish I had. And, <laughs> you know, that's completely irreversible. Like, what do you Yeah, say yeah, like you're, you're screwed. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So that's it's like, the, so it's like the doctor taking out the, uh, the, the wrong kidney. Uh, sorry. <laughs> then there's, there's the ban on, um, there's the ban on blood donations, which they actually, you're not completely banned for life anymore. You're just banned for the first year after you ever have gay sex. So, um, well, how does that make any sense? They just arbitra it's arbitrary and stupid. Is yeah, they just did. arbitrarily say you're banned for a year and then you're fine. To get blood, you should just have to go through a simple blood test. Does this person have any communicable diseases? Yeah, that, that... Or, or, no. Why Take is the that? Blood. Why is that even a? An, uh... I'm, so, I, I'm, okay, well. I'm not. I'm a little. Okay, I, I admittedly, I'm a little naive on some of this stuff. So, so here's why. It's because in the in, when the AIDS scare first started happening, they weren't sure how the blood si supply was becoming infected, mm -hmm. and because they believed it was literally before it was called AIDS and HIV, it was called GRID, which was gay related immune disorder. Yeah, I remember like that. They, yeah. So they thought they were protecting the blood supply and. I'm not even saying that was not a hundred percent, maybe, maybe well intended from within the scientific community, but in the larger sense that it was becoming politicized during a time when there was a backlash from the public against this liberation movement that was only ten years old at the time, um, it became associated with this stigma, like that gays are dirty and our blood is dirty and that we're killing. Where you know what I mean? Like yeah, no. our blood. Just, it does not fit to be in the blood supply. So anyway, um, it wasn't very long before science caught up and they were able to protect the blood supply by the same test that protects it today, which is actually more sensitive than the one you get at an actual HIV clinic. So the part where there was maybe, you know, a plausible reason is long um, gone. Is long gone. It's well, like no, the, 30 <laughs> oh yeah, no, yeah. that that's what I meant though. Because I, I and if I, if I, I'm sorry if I, I misspoke there, because I I I know a, I, I know a little bit about the the you know, the history, the beginning history, but I but I, that's what I meant. Like now, that's what I was talking about. Like that's all been like kind of they kind of figured out. Oops, yeah, we, we can do this now. We can protect this, and we've been able to for a long time. So why is it still? Uh, why is it still? Why is there this ridiculous well, one year and then you're okay ban? Like what is that? What's that well, about? They just barely they just barely dropped it out till last year oh really yeah like that was like last year's big victory and it was wow. like wow like pulling teeth to get that because and even then that's it's that's so what stupid. That's they what... just ask you are, are you uh have you had homosexual relationship in the last year you can straight up lie yeah it's self-reported and it's not it's a lot so... of the a lot of the people that are practicing how do I put it? If you're if you're having to practice your sexuality kind of in the dark, in more of the at risk. I mean, how do I put this gently? There are a lot of married men who participate in risky behaviors because they're doing it on the DLO, on the down low. Well, sure. So they're, going, they're going to places like adult bookstores or bathhouses and engaging in sex with you know gay men who are themselves drug users or whatever it is, IV drug users, you know, that shit still happens. I mean, well, no, I, yeah, I, I, I I'm, totally I'm aware of that, <laughs> but that, unfortunately, I, I I'm going to interject for a second. Cause I was just listening to Milo Yiannopoulos, I think yesterday or the day before, and he was saying that that was a good thing and he wanted to see more of that. And he's a, he's a gay libertarian. And he says that that was, the fact that that trend is in a downward spiral, and I'm not, I'm not saying I agree or disagree or anything, because I'm, like Jeremy said, I guess I'm kind of naive on this stuff too, but he was saying that it was a good thing because because of the fact that that trend is on a downward spiral, you're seeing less reproduction among gay people. So he, he's saying you see trends like higher IQ among gay people. You see like um, just like a counter perspective of society. And he says, oh, that's really good and valuable for society, right? And so there is this element of it that's bad and risky. So you have like these, the, 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 the unhealthy aspect, like you said, drug users, uh, stuff like that. Well, but at the same no, time, I, the, the marriages I, I, might be a good thing for them just to you know, reproduce. Not, not to say that there aren't other alternatives, but those other alternatives are significantly more complicated and expensive, right? 
No, well, I'm not trying to demonize those behaviors. In fact, I would rather destigmatize them. Like there's nothing wrong with living one's life however one feels self-actualized. I'm only saying that in the case of somebody who's going to self-report whether they've had gay sex in the last year, the people who are maybe likely to lie about that are people who quite possibly have actually been in a really high risk. You know what I mean? Yeah, they're on the the down low. The stigma shouldn't be even there anyways. Like like we were saying earlier, the stigma behind questionable blood donations shouldn't even be there now. Right. Well, see, I I was just going to say, it it seems to me that this is like a... I don't know, maybe at this point, third or fourth order, unfortunately, effect of the state, because it's the same principle of black markets that yeah, I was say when that. you're it's when, the when, they're, when you're forced into these when you're forced to use black markets because the state has either made something illegal or in this case, they had made certain certain acts like sodomy was illegal for a long time, like Dave mentioned earlier. And but even like these little measures like you're talking about, Mike, all of these things add up. And that's what helps perpetuate the stigma. So it's actually, so, I mean, some people would say, oh, no, this is a societal issue where society is the one that ha- that stigmatizes it. Yes, but why? Just like with slavery. Slavery was perpetuated because of the government. So in this situation, it's the same thing. This type of stuff is perpetuated because of the state. And that's why these, right. that's why these stigmas continue. And that's why these, these, these individuals have, feel the need to run and hi- to hide their behavior and take these more riskier, yeah. take, takes more risk. And it, it oh, man, it just pisses me off in one state but there's still the um there's still like the social aspect of it too right it's not it's not like socially accepted among absolutely oh no no but that's what i'm saying i i think the social the reason it's still stigmatized socially is because the state's perpetuated because the state helped by keeping things banned for so long so i hear what you're saying i don't know that's just what i'm seeing i I just my my mode look at what we what we would be if it was legal but isn't the state usually like a lagging indicator of culture? Always, though? always. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's got to be the people themselves that the re- that's the reason why the state is the way it is. Like, no, like I was saying before, I'm not I'm not saying that the state doesn't ex- the existence of the state doesn't exacerbate that or make it worse. But it all it all seems like it comes down to like a property rights issue to me. Why like why is the state involved with banning sexual acts between consenting partners? Why is the state involved with marriage? Why is the state involved with blood donations? Why is the state involved in any of that shit? Right. We actually are in agreement, Jared. I I just meant the no, state perpetuated it. No, no, I meant the state perpetuated. It. You're right, though. That that the, originally, the, why why did the state do these things? Because people were like, "Do this, do this. We need laws." And that so, is, yeah. I mean, that is kind of changing now too. Which I, which I that's well, a really yeah, great thing. and 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 anti homosexual bigots are dying off. You might have if you've ever heard this talking point that floats around whatever you do in the bedroom is your business but i don't want to hear about it and yeah um that i should you know hide where am i going with this okay so coming out like the fact that we came out the reason why we have to have um parades because it wasn't originally about you know riding down the street in a float and having the Wells Fargo diversity team wave at us from on the top of their, you know, war march. <laughs> no, it was, it was originally, it was a political march. It was a show of numbers and a show of, of pride. Like the reason why pride became an organizing principle is because we had been told we should be ashamed of ourselves. And the political culture we were in was a reflection of the social culture, like we were just talking about. So in the beginning, in the 70s, when people started coming out, that was considered a political direct action. And it was political radicals who saw the social value in doing that. So by me refusing to hide in the darkness and coming out in the opening and practicing my lifestyle as if oh. I am not ashamed of it, um, was kind of, that was, I mean, more than any other single like thing that we did, that has been credited with um, being the, the turning point because the more people came out and the more people had to understand that they had friends and family and guess what, husbands and wives and daughters, and so, you know, that were LGBT, that were GSM. <laughs> <laughs> Almost um, slipped there. <laughs> Good yeah, catch. <laughs> suddenly they realized that like, it wasn't this shameful thing that was happening in like a dark alley even though it was because they were shaving it. Um, but it was something that's all around us, and it's not. Isn't that crazy how the, the, the uh, even sexual acts can kind of be pushed into the black market, and then that black market creates deleterious effects? 
It does. I have to say that word because of Jared. And sure. You know, can you, so think about um, how kind of instinctual the sex drive is. Like it's how, it's what we, it's why our species, like we are wired to want to <clears throat> engage in sexual behavior. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a really like when you are taught that this core piece of yourself is not even worthy of seeing the light of day. Right. So I don't get to build a relationship. I have to go in a dark alley and have like a 10 minute one and then go home and, and you know, lie to my wife. Right. Um, when this really core piece of my identity is is shoved into the darkness, like they lived miserable, miserable lives back then. And, you know, even today, at least I, my life doesn't have to be that miserable, you know, but there's still somewhat of an undercurrent of the stigma. And so, you know, having, I want a bazooka and I feel the same way, man. <laughs> I understand. Just, they ain't going to let me get one. They're not going to let me get one. I, I think I understand where you're coming from, Mike. I still have, and I don't mean to come across contrary because I don't know anybody else's experience, right? Uh, it still seems to me, though, like a lot of a lot of the negative experience people go through when they're gay is from the people they know directly, which, like you said, it is a social problem. And it sucks that the, those, you know, those people that are so adamantly anti-gay, like they're so passionate about that stance that they'll get the government involved. But at the same time, you see the swing back from that, too, on, uh, from, from the gay side, right? So you see people that want to ban discrimination essentially i mean like look at like the like the gay wedding cake scenario or the bathroom issue where even though i personally don't think that one should discriminate on those bases um if a private property owner who owns a bathroom doesn't want to let certain people go in particular bathrooms they're not i don't see why they should be bound by the state to have rules for their own bathrooms, right? Or if a if a provider of a good or service doesn't want to provide that yeah, good or service, it should be a market for, demand for anybody, regardless of any reason. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't really matter. And regardless of whether or not discrimination is right or wrong, should the state step in and use violence against that person? I, I would say, as a libertarian, I would say no. Go so ahead. this is where we come back to the the metaphor of being a bridge, because the way that you just frame that is kind of at the libertarian end of the bridge. So let's imagine what's at the other end of the bridge because think about what a bridge actually does. It, okay, it takes an impassable geographic space like a canyon or a really deep river that I can't wade or swim across, right? Some, where I have no way of getting to the other side unless I build a, something so solid that I can trust my life in crossing it, right? Yeah. And what does that look like? It has really solid, like it's an engineering a marvel of, of, of human ingenuity and it's solid at both ends and all the way across so let's look at the gsm end of that bridge we have people who the state is deceiving into believing that it is the solution <laughs> and hero. Let, let's look at the kernel of truth there if the state's being used as a weapon against you and you instinctually know that you have a right to self-defense, does not the state seem like a rational means of self-defense? I'm not saying by our, by libertarian perspective, because we have the non-aggression principle. We know that, okay? But at the other end of the bridge, they don't. See what I mean? So Yeah, it's, it's uh, well, if the, it's the rationalization or not, well, well I do pseudo-rationalization that might makes right, so let's get in on that mind. Yeah. No, I do see that, right. and I do see that they don't realize that. And to some extent, I'm slightly forgiving for that. But at the end of the day, logic is still logic. And regardless of what happens to you or how you've been victimized throughout your life, there is it, – it's not just defense at a certain point. When you're using the state, you're – relying on tax money. So to me, I mean, the other the other side of that coin, I would say, is that to give them a pass or to give anybody a pass, really, just because they don't understand the non-aggression principle or because they don't understand that they're actually benefiting from theft, they're trying to benefit from theft, they're trying to use a theft-funded monopoly on force against somebody else. The fact that they doesn't they don't understand that doesn't change the consequences of their action, right? It, it, to me, ignorance is no excuse, and it seems like paternalism in a sense. You don't want to shield them from the consequences by pretending that it's okay. No, or, I'm saying that you don't run to the other end of the bridge and lead with bigotry as free speech. 
That does not sound like a wealthy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm, just, not I'm, sorry, okay. I'm not saying that. That's just not okay. I'm not saying that. Yeah, I guess. I, I, I but, 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 but at the same it, time, but at the same time, free speech does include bigotry, right? And even if you don't agree with what somebody's saying, or if you don't agree with somebody's bigotry, part of free speech is not initiating force against the bigot who's just speaking their mind, even as bigot as, as it is, right? I get that. So. And they will certainly discover that that is very boldly pro proclaimed once they reach our end of the bridge. Yeah. Uh, at the other end of the bridge, where we're saying you can trust your life by crossing this bridge, which is what we do when we are um, when we trust our life to the political system, right? Everybody understands that's a life or death thing. That I want to live in a socio-political environment that is best that I see is, is the best means of achieving self-actualization, whatever it is that in the Declaration of Independence, uh, to institute governments as they see fit, as they believe, well, you know that phrase, whatever it is, right? That's, what, that's why we do this, right? So if I'm gonna cross this bridge, I, again, I'm talking about the GSM end. I'm not talking about our end where we have the benefit of all these nuanced and all these discussions that we have about political theory, like we have the benefit of that. And I agree with you. If you want to be a bigot, go be a bigot. And keep your cheap cake and shove it up your ass. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but at the other end of the bridge, we have people who are being deceived by their politicians. And, uh, you know, my job is to present material that helps them see that the non aggression principle is a solution, right? So that's what this get your laws off our backs is all about. You, so that instead of standing there going, hi, bigotry is free speech, but come on over, right? Who's gonna do that? You know, instead I'm out there, hey, the state is the biggest, the biggest harm in your life. Yeah, yeah. Monkey, right, you, well, yeah, I mean, bigotry, bigots have no power without the state, essentially, like bigots. Exactly. <laughs> You're right. Exactly. And this right is here. what that looks like. This and, is what that looks like. <laughs> and, and you got you got some good points. You you have to go in and you have to you know you have to go back into the cave sometimes. And you have to say, hey guys, there's light outside. You know, and, and I understand what what you're doing, and and I applaud you, man. You got to get you got to get the message out any way you can. So how like what do you guys do as far as this type of outreach? Do you, like do you just do you go to already existing events or do you set up your own events or a little of both or? Well, so a lot of um, what we're trying to grow into is doing our own pride outreaches, you know, so we've been around for about 15 years. Okay. Um, and historically we've basically been available when, you know, the state and county level affiliates are going out to do a pride festival. And part of the awareness that I'm really trying to, okay, you're at a pride festival to basically party. You're there to drink beer and listen to music. And um, nobody wants to talk to an economic scheme <laughs> at a pride festival. So like bless their or hearts. Ever, like, really. <laughs> or ever really. So, you know, it's really, it's a lot more helpful to have an actual GSM person. Sorry. We have this world's gayest political quiz that we came up with. Hopefully the readers are able to, maybe it'll be in the comments then or something, but mm -hmm. basically we just, we, we made the, we made the Nolan chart rainbow. So on the right hand, it's red and left is blue, get it? Red and blue. <laughs> and it is of course gold and the status end is royal purple. So um, that worked out really well. And then we came up with actual 10 actual questions of uh, kind of drawing from the get your laws of our backs things. Like should, El should, oh my gosh, I need to fix that. <gasps> GSM migrants. It still says LGBT, and so, <laughs> so I mean, should GSM migrants be placed in immigrant, immigration detention and sent back to the country where they will be thrown from a roof? Yeah, probably not, right? <laughs> so they it basically, it takes that, and here's the other thing where we, we, we understand the reality. At the other end of the bridge, they're doing single issue politics. I know at the libertarian end of the bridge, we come to understand that like the Federal Reserve and the, the warfare police state and all these other things are like, um, so much bigger, <laughs> so central to the oppressive environment that we're all living in, right? That I get to widen up the scope of my, of my political life and, and speak to all of that. And that's a beautiful thing at our end of the bridge. But at the other end of the bridge, there's been this divide and conquer thing and single issue politics are one and of marginalization. 
and what yeah and that's one of those tactics so meeting it's like you're gay friends. you're stupid you can only be worried about this one thing and that's all you need to be worried about exactly. thank you goodbye yeah. And you only and you you're only allowed to do that when we push the gay button, and the rest of the time you're supposed to sit there and shut up until we need your ten percent, and then we'll push the gay button, and then you can speak, right? <laughs> yeah, and that's exactly how it is. So the whole point of the gayest political quiz is to go ahead and meet that population um, where they are at and invite them to begin exploring um, what's on our side of the bridge to say, hey, you know come on over, you know, you don't have to stay, but at least just come look around, right? And maybe, and then maybe you do that and you find out that, you know, Ancapistan is a complete paradise and you decide to stay. That's hopefully the goal. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's, that's, always that's what happened. <laughs> oh yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's, yeah. again, it, 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 makes, it makes sense. I mean, I, I've obviously never considered it, but it makes perfect sense. How else, how else are you going to outreach? And especially when it's, on, on, it, as we talked about before, anybody who's been marginalized, any minority who's been overly oppressed by the state historically only knows one response, and that's try to get the state to work for us because it's been used against us. So, and and, and again, just, just and any all, all those other groups, the same things happen. It becomes a one issue thing for the most part because they're liter in where other people maybe you know other people who are not a minority but don't really pay attention to politics. You know, there's plenty of, there's plenty, there's plenty of regular white people out there that just don't care enough, but they're one issue, the one issue voters, but that's cause that's all they have to care about. Cause they're just, cause everything else is just like, ah, oh, whatever. But people who have been oppressed by the state or oppressed because of the state or oppressed and the state has helped, you know, in this situation perpetuated, like I was talking about before, skipped merrily along yeah but you don't like your your one issue because it's almost life or death in a lot of situations so yeah it kind of makes sense that the old one of the only or at least the the quickest way to get to them is through a political action but what you're try trying to do is basically take them there and then take them right you know hopefully get them right back out on the other side like hey here's the bridge on this side keep going though because we yeah. get we get past That's everything once we get this way <laughs> you know and we took a lot of care to make sure that we were grounding this in the non aggression principle because i'm not into this i don't know i there is a there's also a radical caucus in the party and outright does represent moderates and radicals so i'm not trying to make a statement on radicalism but for me um the principle is the thing that i like to center in my work because to me that's that's the root of that's why like libertarianism is a radical philosophy by definition it goes to the root and the root is coercion and it says let's call out coercion and, and eliminate it from human in, in, in yes. relationships so anyway um you know I, there's this um there's this just this like and the minute you still, oh, identity politics, oh, you're trying to divide us. And there's like this huge blind spot. And like the news I had to tell people is like, we don't have to be afraid of saying the word GSM because we have the non-aggression principle. Like we're never going to be on that slippery slope as long as we keep the principle in, in focus, in not just in focus, but like as centered the principle. Like it's always grounded in the principle. I'm using the principle to deconstruct the way the political system is harming the community. And as long as we're always doing that, like we're never going to be on that slippery slope. So, um, but within the movement, there is that kind of uphill because, and rightfully so, I understand the state has used that as a weapon, right? And so we don't want to become vulnerable to that and we don't want to make the same error in reasoning. So in a sense, like I can kind of forgive the idea that, okay, we don't want to go down that road, right? But like, we're not on that road. We are on the non-aggression principle end of the bridge, right? So. We're just saying, okay, all roads lead to liberty, right? So cross the bridge this way. It's okay if I understand that maybe there's more than one bridge. Maybe there's a Black Lives Matter bridge, right? You know, hello. I mean, who's doing police brutality about the state? I mean, I don't see why it's such a, why is it, I don't know why we're not allowed to like talk about that. I, actually, I do because libertarians don't want to be on the slippery slope and there's a mistrust of identity politics and so there's a blind spot there can i add can, i'm They're sorry can ask. i ask what can i ask what you mean by slippery slope you've used that, that term a few times i don't I, i'm just kind of what do you so, mean by slippery slope there is an undercurrent of where like if we do identity politics then we're going to be on a slippery slope towards like liberal leftist kind of um 
exactly within the LP. The if you just if you just start using the rhetoric to get these people, then then the party's politics are going to change to reflect that. Um, no, I wouldn't even say it's within the LP. I would. That's kind of even among sort of like. Are you just talking about the uh, the, the the outright the move the movement in general, just across both capital and small L. You hmm. know, everywhere anybody who's been influenced by sort of like the paleo libertarianism wing. Right, that whole everything that grew out of Lou Rockwell and this this thing that we have to push all of the identity politics, all of the fringe people out of the party, and there's this rhetorical space around all of that that says um, this is not something that we talk about, right? Because we're on a slippery slope, slope towards collectivism. I guess I've never really seen that as a slippery slope, but rather as um, something a criticism of something that it results in the opposite of its intended effects not so much like this is going to lead to this if we give this one allowance compromise yeah i mean i i just don't i i, I don't see the slippery slope I'm, I'm not saying it's not there that you're not i'm not saying it's not there that you don't perceive it or anything like that it just to me it seems like <clears throat> less a slippery slope what what libertarians are criticizing and more um does this result in its intended effect or does it result in the opposite of its intended effect? Do you know what I mean? Well, I do, but however you want to frame it, that's what I'm kind of saying. We, that's why we have the non-aggression principle. Like we're never going to have the unintended sure. effect because we have the non-aggression principle. That's what it's for. Okay. Okay. I, I guess I see yeah. what you're saying. So I you're, just... you're saying you're, you're trying to change like the identity politics outreach, base it in the nap and that's how you build the bridge. Well, yeah, like I don't. I, I, I love that idea, man. That's why really. Would we, that's a why really challenging thing to do. Why would we systematically go through all of the all of the groups that are out there that are divided, right? They are, and so I mean, yeah, I think this strategy can work for pretty much any camp. We could do this for women's issues. We could do this for um, migrant, you know, communities of color. Any anybody who has been divided and conquered by that strategy, we could do this because the state is the source of that harm. Right. And so I guess, you know, in terms of outright, yeah, I focus that awareness on GSM issues. But in the larger sense, it is a barrier. I mean, the minute you say, I mean, and it just depends who you're talking to. Right. Um, some people are more resistant than others. But the ones that are resistant, like the minute you say it, like you just see their eyes glaze over and they like turn away and they're like, I don't know. It's just I mean, it happens They're especially especially people that are coming from a social conservative kind of Republican background, and they're looking for a justification to continue pretending that social issues don't matter. So they go into this like, oh, it's collectivism, like sort of. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, it, I'm it does. taking it in a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I kind of get what you're saying on, on a lot of this stuff. I do, and me too. It my inclination to play devil's ad advocate is maybe it is collectivism just a little bit, right? Like, is there a place for... How am I as an individual collectivism? I'm not saying that you as an individual are. I'm I'm saying that the... I think maybe what a lot of people worry about, regardless of whether it's what, you know, being gay or be, being a communist or being anything, people look at it as when you go into like politics with this like we um, mind state instead of like this I mind state. I mean, it makes me personally a little uneasy whenever, whenever anybody talks about things in terms of we when I don't know what we means, you know what I mean? Because you could say we and you could be we as gay people, but you still wouldn't speak for all gay people, right? I could say <clears throat> we as libertarians, but I still wouldn't speak for all libertarians uh, as much as I would like to be able to, you know what I mean? So at the same time, I mean, I think there is a legitimate concern that maybe people get too wrapped up in, you know, the identity of it, regardless of whether it's uh, being gay or being libertarian, and tend to generalize in terms of, you know, we as a collective, which kind of brings things out of focus from the non-aggression principle and property rights. I'm, and I'm not saying that's a criticism of you, and I'm actually really happy to s hear what you have to say, Mike, because if someone, if there's, there's people like you there as a backstop to stop people from taking identity politics to, like, the furthest logical 
and I use that term lo loosely logical, status conclusion to where they're actually initiating force against people, that's awful. But the fact that there are people that can root that stuff in the non-aggression principle and prevent that type of thing from happening, kind of draw people back, I think that's really awesome. So I just heard you articulate the exact reluctance. So I, I guess I can thank you for that was like a complete, like, a, like, I don't want, what's the, like, you just became the poster child. <laughs> well, that's, that's what I was, when I was trying to play devil's advocate, I think that's where a lot of those people are coming from. This probably what you hear. No, right? I know, I know where they're coming from. I get that, but that's all I'm saying. That's why we have the non-aggression principle. Keep calm and do non-aggression and we're fine. Yeah, see that. I mean, that's the only thing I was gonna say. I mean, I I, I hear what you were saying, Jared, and I and and I can see and I I can see where where people might come from on that too. But I mean, the one thing you you've you've reiterated probably more than anything else during this entire conversation so far, Mike, is the fact that you try you make sure to let everybody let it not just yourself, but let it be known that you're grounding everything in the non-aggression principle. So if that's right. constantly be to me, I I think that kind of nips that idea of collectivism in the bud a little bit because if you're if you're if you're always yeah. staying focused on the non-aggression principle you necessarily have to be thinking about the individual in that aspect so yeah. so where it can be perceived as collectivized and i get like i said jared i get what you're saying and i get why these you know i get why people would would you know would, would think well, that i mean Maybe even just a... even just this situation right like i can trust mike as far as the non-aggression principle but that doesn't necessarily mean that i could trust everybody that he set you know ropes into the category of we or you know libertarians go of there oh yeah of course of course right well so yeah the, i mean oh, yeah, yeah. everyone's oh, yeah, sure. an individual right exactly that's that's all i'm trying to say here you know it, it's not that uh, collectivism is inherently dangerous it's just an idea right but it, it, it just i don't want to get per me personally i wouldn't want to get too far away from property rights i think the non-aggression pr principle balances it the non-aggression principle is based in property rights absolutely it's the flip side it's the duty that comes with the with property rights right so i just think i think that i think it's a hell of a challenge to try to tackle something like this without we, we, trying to draw people back from the state that's a hell of a challenge man it's, it's that's to that to that same degree i used to be a minarchist right and i don't try to i don't actively try to like draw minarchists into anarchism or anything like that i'm not saying that there's no sense to it or that there it wouldn't be fruitful to try for some people it's just not my thing it's a hell of a challenge and uh, i respect it a lot mike i think that like i said it's really cool it's, it's really awesome it, it must be a hell of a challenge for you. Well, it has well, to be done. <laughs> no, but I, I enjoy a challenge. And, you know, I really like that, you know, there's that joke about what's the difference between a, a libertarian and an anarchist about six months. Because right. I think I think the principle itself radicalizes people. And there are a subset of people who are really scared and they never cross the bridge to minar or to anarchy. But and there's a most of us who were born with rational mind. I mean, I don't want to collectivize it. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't I don't have numbers and I don't have whole data. I don't know how yeah. many people go ahead and cross over to anarchism. But I know that um, for me, when things really clicked is when the principle took root in my heart. And I began building my ideas around it, right? And so right. I think the really beautiful thing about framing, especially in this context, it has a value in the party and keeping it principle, right? Because doing electoral politics is already playing with fire. Like it just, it already is, right? So uh, it's another reason I really think centering the principle is just so primarily important that you really can't even go through a conversation without me talking about it because it's so 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 important i i'm for anything that gets the idea to new ears so unless it involves violence see it's funny though because what you know you're talking about when you were saying before about how this could be used in 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 other ways like uh you know for example like the black lives matter or any any more like you said any marginalized or 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 minority or or, or oppressed group or whatever this type of outreach that you guys do could could be used in those situations and it just it came to mind to me that most people in the lp could probably use the same exact outreach because they don't understand i i've been arguing with these idiots ever since the whole johnson and weld thing got decided and it just it just boggles my mind how many 
so-called libertarians don't understand the non-aggression principle and the fact that what they're actually doing by trying to get these people elected is 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 eventually going to violate the goddamn principle. So why are you <laughs> you don't understand libertarianism and you're and you're yelling at anarchists for trying to ruin things? Like no, we're trying to take all of us to the logical conclusion. That's, so right, you know, that's, that's what I'm saying, dude. That happens in just straight up libertarian circles. It's hard enough. So I, it that's a huge risk, man. Like trying to get someone riled up about politics, just like in general, or like trying to take that route and not have a solid you know, foundation in the non-aggression principle, like you said, Mike, not bringing it up in every conversation, you, you ha basically have to, or else people just go to. astray. You have to. And yeah, it's just really important. So within the party, we have this thing called the Dallas Accord. So um, the idea is that minarchists and anarchists can work together. And as long as we're shrinking government towards a more non-coercive world, then we're, we're able to stay on more or less the same page. And so I, the really th cool thing, I think, from Outright's perspective, doing it this way, is that we invite people across the bridge, and then when they're on our end, by the time they come in, they've been educated on this principle, and then they can make it their own individual autonomous choice as to how small is small enough for them. And I'm pretty confident that, like I discovered, the non-aggression principle, it it draws its own conclusions. Like, what do you say to that? Once you understand it, there's really nowhere else for the mind to go, right? So as long as we're educating people on, on, on that, as we draw them across, here's why this philosophy is powerful. Here's how this philosophy can set you specifically free. And then the more that they come across, then, you know, they become exposed to everything else. Well, here's what happens if we dismantle the central bank. Here's what happens if we dismantle, you know, the, the system of taxation that centralizes wealth, right? Here's what happens when we dismantle all of those things. Not only do you get set free socially, but you get set free economically too. And that's an amazing thing. Like it's an incredibly powerful philosophy. And there's a lot in the, um, the classical liberal tradition that speaks to the heart of what a modern liberal is thinking they're, you know, getting and not getting, right? So there's the deception that's saying, oh, here's what we're giving you on a silver platter. It's all a big lie, right? But it's rooted in that desire for um, a very virtuous ethical society, right? So, I mean, it's really not really a stretch at all to just express to people how this philosophy is the real means of achieving that. Like, it's, I don't know, it's not a hard sell at all. It's just, I don't know, for a long time, and I, I mean, bless their hearts, I'll say that again, you know, but the, <laughs> the low hanging fruit on the small government conservative side was like seen as the thing to go for. And, you know, yes, it's more of a challenge to go for some of the other, but I'm sorry, but that is just, you know, we've, that ship has sailed. Oh, I, mean, <laughs> I think it's a challenge to, I think it's a challenge to try to go after anybody who is committed to using the state for any purpose, personally. I mean, just to I, go after them directly, you know what I mean? Even when, when I engage people in conversation, I don't ever do it unless I know somebody else can perceive it because, I mean, when you when you confront somebody directly and you're trying to change their mind and, and you have def definitely a different strategy than me, you're finding common ground first and then moving on from there. I, 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 I don't do that at all, personally. <laughs> Um, so it takes, you know, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, so I, I it's not saying I don't try to go through any rapport building at all, but I'm definitely not the type to just be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I won't not say something in a contrarian way, I guess. And it, 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 it can be pretty difficult for any, for, for anybody committed to the state, like I said, whether it's identity politics or well, they're most likely not going to listen to you anyways. Well, well yeah, um, exactly. It is because they're, they're, um, but, their preference you know, Mike's, for state action. Mike might have an in with them and get them to listen. And, and you know, the, the truth is like a virus. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. And well, it, I mean, yeah, and how, you know, it's a good thing to make that common ground too. I mean, my background, my professional background in in sales, and the way I spread libertarianism isn't the way I approach sales at all, which is kind of weird because uh, the people don't buy something in sales for the same reason they buy libertarianism. Likewise, they don't resist libertarianism for the same reason they you know resist 
purchasing something. Mm. My, my experience when somebody resists or rejects libertarianism or the non-aggression principle, and it's not that it's a hard sell, because it's not, it's, it, it's axiomatic, right? It's apodictically true. But when somebody rejects libertarianism in the non-aggression principle, it's usually because they have something personal you know, from further back in their lives or something that they're struggling with. And that's not usually something I'm ever hoping to help, you know, or it's not that I'm not hoping to help them overcome it. I'm not expecting to be able to help them overcome it. You know what I mean? So it's, it, it's it, for me, after having done it for so many years, and you, you said you have as well, Mike, um, for me personally, I just, I don't ever even hope to convince someone I'm talking directly to, but I always end up getting feedback from conversations from other people who, you know, they give you feedback and they say, you know, this kind of changed my mind about this because I never looked at it that way. I mean, is, do you get as much as of that or you do, do you approach, do you, you know, do you approach people like one-on-one -on -one head on? Um, well, the way I think of it is in kind of, um, you know, I think of it in like the terms of, this is gonna sound bad shit nuts, but like some of the nature religions, they had like the different like water, earth, air. So when we're doing political activism, we're being water, right? Water, one drop at a time can carve out a giant canyon. So each conversation that I have is just, it's just eroding that wall a little bit further, right? I'm not gonna cause someone to have a bright light moment in a single, like I'm not a burning bush. I'm not gonna be the one who, who does that for somebody, sure. right? But if I, in one conversation, could plant one more bit of seeds, right? If my little water droplet can erode just one more molecule off of that, you know, wall, then over time, all of us having those conversations, we are going to carve a giant, like we're going to tear down the wall. Great analogy. Thought, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that doesn't sound bad shit crazy. I, I like that. Oh, yeah, I, I like that a lot, actually. Well, you know what? It's 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 funny because Jared, I, I'm kind of along the same lines as you, where I I don't do outward, like I don't do like the one on one conversations a lot, and I do rely heavily on the people who are surrounding me or or whether or on social media who are reading along to be picking up what I'm what I'm actually saying, not the person I'm actually engaging with. Um, I've used that tactic for a long time now, and it, and it actually has had success. I mean, between that and the show, you know, Dave and I have had, a, you know, quite a number of people like it, it still blows my mind every time somebody comes up to me and is like, hey, you know, you're kind of the one that and like, you know, anytime somebody <laughs> says that, it's like, yeah, I don't okay. believe it. I don't. I don't either. The, the couple of people have kept trying to insist that I'm like, I really do know. It can't possibly. Yeah, be. I'm an idiot. I have, me, I have no like, idea what the hell I'm talking about. You open my eyes, but, and I'm like, I didn't open nothing. Yeah, but but so I, I'm very similar to you, Jared. But like like Dave was starting to hint at before, Mike has, and you said it too, though, Jared. Mike has a very different tactic, and it's working because because as you just described, Mike, that's that's more your skill set. You're not the burning bush. You're more. And oh this, man, it's not even just a different tactic. It's a different. It's a. It's well, it's a, a different fresh perspective. It's completely. not the burning it's, it's bush. It's awesome. There, it's a. It's a flaming. Well, it, it it goes it goes to what it goes <laughs> to. What, I to think of that. <laughs> He's the flaming mohawk. The, the flaming, flaming mohawk. <laughs> The flaming mohawk. There you go. It's, it's a great pers it's a great perspective, though, right? I mean, the, the perspective that we come at it from, Jeremy, even just trying to sell somebody on that, being like, oh, never even – might as well give up hope that you'll ever change anybody's mind directly. You know what I mean? Like, it happens rarely. But, I mean, it's, it's, you're not going to sell somebody on that. Mike's perspective and the way he's saying it, I mean, that's – um. I think it's a lot more optimistic. I think even that's an easier I think, I, sell. I don't think what we do is mind-changing. I think what it is is consciousness rattling. We walk up and we, we say, hey, here's some information you've never heard. And it usually perturbs that consciousness so hard that they either have to fight hard to prove you wrong and end up proving you right through doing it, or they completely ignore you and you're never going to reach them again. Well, yeah, it's cognitive dissonance. And that goes back to what I said about the major obstacles, you know, to libertarian, you know, somebody accepting libertarianism or the non-aggression principle going back to, you know, um, previously held beliefs or things in their past. Uh, and, and, and just not to be like corny about it or to be like over psychological, but it, it's um, it's lack of self-knowledge, right? It's not really understanding themselves or why why they fully do the things they do. I mean, a lot of people, I think, 
regardless of whether they they choose government or statism or activism or anything, usually it's a revolt against either a revolt against the way they grew up or an attempt to emulate it completely. And in my experience, that's what I see anyway. So I think that there is a lot of value in trying to connect with people on a one on one basis, just not in like a public uh, uh, setting. Oh. So if you if you have somebody that wants to connect on a one on one basis, they're not gonna they're not gonna try to contact you on social media on your wall. They're gonna hit you up in your messages, or they'll call you up and say, "Hey, do you want to hang out?" or something like that. You know what I mean? Then at that point, you'll talk with them. So I think there's a lot of value in 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 that. I think there's just different venues, right? There's a time of time and a place for everything. Well, sure, but there's also, I mean, what I was going to say is, I mean, it's, this is one thing that Dave says all the time, you know, the, all about as, you know, as many tactics as you can, use them all. Oh, yeah, and, it's attack from all and, angles. And, and, and the, the, I guess, you know, the main difference is, you know, D Jared, basically what you and I do is just throw stuff out in the wind and see where it sticks, which definitely has, you know, like you said, you get feedback from other people who are paying attention to the conversation. I do too, you know what somebody like Mike is doing is, is more personable, um, Definitely. but it's all, and it's, it's a law. It, it may be the long game, but that's needed too. Cause what is the thing we, <laughs> as the, well, as, as the collect, as, as, as the, as the, as you know, as the collect, as the collective freedom minded people who want to see a free society. We alert, we alert. Exactly. Well, hey, I did, I did it, man. I did it. All right. I did, I did the, oh, Jared can't see me. That's right. I put air quotes on that, Jared. Sorry. Um, uh, okay. the, the, we, um, you know, the people that seek a free society, what is the, what is the most important thing we need? Numbers. We need people that understand the non-aggression principle. And maybe what what I was gonna say is maybe it's not maybe his method is not the long game though. I mean, may, how do you know that he, uh, talking one on one with people or connecting with somebody on that sort of level, you're not gonna reach somebody that's just got amazing social media reach or will yeah, someday? Exactly. I mean, oh no, no, that's oh of course no. I didn't mean that, but he, I was just going off of what Mike had said about the fact that, you know that the, the one drop of water analogy that that whole oh, yeah, thing exactly. that that that's just what I meant. That it, and, and I'm not saying it's wrong. Well, I'm just saying that, and, you know what 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 exact exact water molecule makes a, a waterfall you know <laughs> well, no, well no you don't you don't know that's the thing I've, i mean i've said that we've all said this for the longest time everybody has their own trigger everybody has that i i truly believe that everybody except the pure sociopath and psychopaths which as we know most of them are are in government aside from them i think everybody has that uh, who has the who has the who has the cognitive ability has that aha moment in them it's just a matter of finding it or them stumbling across or whatever it is. So it could be, you know, there's just, there's so many ways to, to reach people. And yeah, the one, the one-on-one -on -one will take, you'll have Dude, to put a little more effort into each you one, which is fine. You know, I just realized my whole problem is because of you saying that just now, my whole problem is that because I've had that aha moment, I assume that everybody else has already too, and they just ignore it and don't care and, and <laughs> want government anyway. And, and I experienced that as like, you motherfucking Oh, no, man, we have that's, and, that, dude, and that's so wrong, they you know have, what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's hard for me to not jump to that, but it is so fucking wrong for me to jump to that. And I think that's what a lot of people probably struggle with. Well, too, and that's right? a lot of people don't understand some of the propaganda that some of us put out, and they're, they're so easy to jump to conclusions and call someone a statist or... Or say, what are you doing? You know, you're, and I'm just Dude, like, some people straight up are, are status though. Well, I mean, sure. But yeah, there's, I, I saw it when you were posting stuff about Donald Trump, they were like so quick to call you a status. Well, oh, yeah. yeah, but sure. Okay. And I'm like, okay. Look, look at, look at the bulk of the people that do, do, do that. The bulk of the people who respond like that are the newer anarchists who are still in that angry anarchist phase. It yeah. almost always is. It's the newcomer. And I, I've talked about this a lot because I was. I, I alienated most of my friends and half of my family in the first year after I found anarchism because I was pissed and I was screaming at everybody, why the fuck don't you get this? I'm explaining it to you. Why don't you get it? <laughs> And and I did. I jumped on everybody. I fell for every bait, like every like even 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 like other anarchists oh, who were just who were just trolling other anarchists just for fun. I fell for it every time because you the status bait. Like you jump on it. You get like poed yeah. on the internet. You don't even know it's sarcasm. You're exactly. Like, Actually, Let me teach you some economics right now. Hey, have you ever heard of the non-aggression? Exactly. <laughs> and but those are the at least when I see those things happen, especially on social media, those it are the happens people. Happens to me. I'll post something, and somebody will jump on me. I'm like, dude, do you you don't even under you're not on my level. 
You have no <laughs> clue what I'm saying. You have I'm on get, like level twenty seven. On my you're level, on like, bitch. You're on like level five. You have you the level of propaganda that I'm at is you can't you're not there. So don't worry about what I'm saying, okay? Don't worry about what I'm saying. You probably it, it probably isn't for you. So, oh man, so many people they just they they want to bed themselves into ideas and slam the wall shut, and they never they think everyone else has got to think like them. And uh, I am really not a fan of that. Well, I, mean, I don't I don't care if people think like me or not. I just don't want them to initiate force against. Well, yeah. So that's that's key. Really. Well, that's what I was going to say to kind of lead us back to what uh, to our actual conversation was that those people, especially the ones that are already quote unquote on this side that are like that, we don't really need to, you know, I personally don't think I need to pay attention to too many of them because I don't have to worry about them for the most part. It, we still have it's the other people that we're still trying to get to cross the damn bridge. That should be more of a focus anyway. So I, I, you know, they, they're going to be out there. The angry, the, like I said, I see the angry anarchist phase happening to so many people. It happened to me hardcore, you know. So I just kind of expect that to be happening to people. And I just kind of, I try to tune them out as best as, as I can and still try to focus on reaching the people that need to be reached, you know. And that's what we do. That's what we do here. That's what I do on the Freedom Fiends. That's what, and, and, and like you said, Jared, this, this, this completely different perspective on things that somebody like Mike is bringing along is awesome because it is attack at all angles. Like you say all the time, Dave. And I, I mean, while I am personally not a fan of using the political angle for anything, me neither, but I don't control anybody. Else. I, I no, don't I, I don't, I, I don't either, but I'm having a hard time of seeing a better way to reach this particular these particular demographics the 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 single the, the, single, the single issue minority whose single issue is self is literally self preservation in a lot of times in a lot of that's situations that's my i'm a single issue minority uh, <laughs> taxation is theft and <laughs> and it's bad for all individuals and the individual is the most oppressed minority in all of human all right all right, right. touche all right, we're, we're gonna touché. try to wrap this up but i want to let you get the last word to anybody that might hear this for the first time they might be a radically political um gay gay person you know they're just fired up ready to get bernie or, or hillary in or whatever or whatever what would you say to them right now if they if they could just listen to you speak, no one interrupted? I would just really encourage them to look at the idea that the mainstream left and the 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 imperial police state are the single greatest source of harm to our community, not only at home, but all around the world that exists. They are completely invested um, in a politics of, of warfare and imprisonment. Um, they're in bed with the banks. Their banking teams march in our pride parades while grassroots organizations are told that our message has is... Yeah, so just look at all that. Open up your mind to the idea that the people who claim they are our friends may not be our friends. Just as we can see on the right that you see, Mike, <laughs> there you were trying to explain the amount of shit that is reality, and you yeah. got caught up. It happens to me all the time. It's like, well, first we need to get rid of the Fed, but then, holy shit, well, we got this thing over there. But <laughs> it's like, I it's get what you're saying. It it's too much. To, it's too much to tell somebody up front. I get what you're but saying. Yeah, just like, open up your mind and just realize the state's not your friend. Yes. Hey, motherfucking men. I think that's something that we can definitely all agree on. Uh, so, yeah, I, I guess we should probably get uh, wrapping up. But this has been a great conversation, Mike. And I, I'm so glad that Sarah reached out to me and, uh, you know, said that she, you know, that and, and actually she wanted to send you in her stead anyway. So this worked out beautifully. Yay. And uh, you want you want to just plug all your you want to just uh, I'll give you a chance to plug all whatever you want to plug really quick before uh, we get out of here. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Plug away. <laughs> so, uh, you can find our Jeremy. website uh. at outrightusa.org. And um, if you're looking for us on Facebook or Twitter, you could just put facebook.com or twitter.com slash outrightusa. Um, and I do want to let you know if you're in, like, the United States, one of the 50 states, you could type in the word outright and the name of your state. For example, I'm in Arizona, so I would type outright Arizona, and you will find a Facebook discussion group so that you can organize with people who are a little bit closer to you. 
Very cool. Yay. Yay. <laughs> I ask every guest first time, what's your favorite quote? If you don't have one, that's fine. Well, okay. I use the same, I've been using the same quote as my email signature for a long time. And it says the most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. And the reality is an individual has an incredible amount of power just simply by recognizing that they do and then speaking and just speaking your truth. So that's not part of the quote, but <laughs> yep, you nailed it. Nice. That's what the quote means to me. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Jared, do you have anything you want to uh, say before we get out of here? Me and Dave will be back next week with the downfall for people who've been missing that. So that, that comes on Fridays. It's no longer live anymore, but if anybody out there and listener land wants to be a guest on that show where, um, we're accepting, uh, Mm-hmm. Excellent. I don't know what to call it. Not applications, because if you want to come on, we'll just fucking let you come on. So. <laughs> All right, yeah, just just hit, just hit the guys up through the, through the seeds pages or through Jared's contact, and they'll get you on the show. So this this has been a lot of fun, and uh, like I said, I'm really glad you came on, Mike. This was uh this was a great 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 talk. Uh, this has been the Seeds of Liberty podcast. All of our information can be found at theseedsofliberty.com. And uh, all our donation stuff is there to make Danilo happy. Uh, Danilo actually should be back next week. Uh, I may not be here because I will be in, well, technically I'll be at Pork Fest, but I'll actually be at Fiend Fest Somalia. Uh, I'm going to try to get set up from there and see, <laughs> see if I can actually do the show. Uh, it, may not, it, it may not work, but Danilo should return. And, uh, I've right. missed the soul patch. Yeah, yeah. Well, you'll have him back next week. So, All right. All right. So, again, this has been the Seas of Liberty podcast. And uh, we'll catch you next time. Peace. Later. (laughs) Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.